stumbled back into uh, the void of obscurity, the void of obscurity that beholds I, the uh, 1980s Michael J. Fox knockoff, Wolfcock Ramirez, with my grainy camera, my alcohol, and more tales of the macabre. <laughs> my God, oh, that just sounded so corny saying it like that. Anyways. This is my second video talking about retro horror paperbacks. Uh, the one of the more genuine forms of entertainment in my mind beats the hell out of phones and iPads. You fucking cunts in your phones and your fucking iPads. <laughs> but I can't talk because I'm doing a video on the internet right now. But uh, it's about as far as I'll go with that. Yeah, last time, same as this time, I talk about maybe about four, or five, six books digging deep down the, down the rabbit hole into you know weird horror, weird weird fiction. Talking about the writers, a little bit about the books without going too deep into it, without talking too flashy about it. You know, no spoilers. Just have a quick yarn about the writers, a quick quick yarn about the book throw it down and move on, you know, there's a, there's a, a busy world out there, you want to, you want to check it out and you want to keep moving and so that's what we're going to do, here we go, so I'm just going to kick straight into it, I would like to talk about this book to start with, uh, with its broken cover, this is old, I think it's one pressing, one pressing only and it's from Hamlin, Hamlin book publishing they had to put out a lot of good stuff like a good old record label you know like uh old school earache or mm, death like silence but <laughs> we're not going there we don't need to go there uh now gerald suster the offering first of all gerald suster is the author of a book called i believe the elect there's another one called the devil's maze all from the early 80s. I think the bloke's been dead for a long time now. I couldn't tell you what year he died. But he's a funny character because Mr. Gerald Suster was a man who happened to come into physical contact and personal contact with some of the final surviving people who came into personal contact with Alistair Crowley. So you can put that one together for yourselves. Moving on, The Offering. You look at this and you think, yeah, cool, this is going to be a super rad splatter punk blood and guts book. You know, you've got a bloody knife, a bloody, you know, razor here. And um, you're not going to be wrong when you look at this book and you think that it is, it's a bloody great book. It's, it's, you know, pocket-sized, quick-moving. It's set in a, town, a small country town called Redding, Reddingdale in uh, Sussex, England. Uh, at first, when I read this book, I was nearly aggravated by it because I thought to myself, well, yeah, there's all of these super prim and proper, douchey, wealthy people in, in their country, in their nice little country stout town with all their estates and everything like that. Uh, but I'm glad I persevered and read this book and don't let that, what I just told you there, deter you at all because this book moves along very quickly. It moves away from the douchiness of the character development and all of these rich, honsy poncy fuckers and things start to get grisly and escalate quite quickly. When a young couple, who are the main characters of the story, move into a house in the village, it's called The Offering. The house is called The Offering and the previous... Uh, and the previous occupants of that house, fuck off, fucking stay there. Yeah. The previous occupants of the house were a, a punk rock musician and his girlfriend. And the punk rock musician obviously became rather disturbed and he killed his girlfriend and then I think he killed himself. And so, of course, when the new couple moves in, they're thinking everything's going to be great, everything's going to be happy, we've moved into this beautiful town, we've got this beautiful house. But then... 
the spirit of this punk rock star starts to uh, influence the man and he starts to become uh, rather reckless and disturbed himself. Meanwhile, the wife, she goes down a different path, which is a whole different other part to the story, which is where all the women in the town are. They are the dominant gender in the town. They lead their men around like dogs on a chain. It's because they are all in cahoots with each other and have some kind of a secret society going on. Uh, so as you can imagine, the, the man and wife who move into the offering itself get influenced by one path and by another and it's not healthy. It's not healthy at all, and it makes for a good climax. It's a good read, good quick read. It'll keep you hanging in there, persevere with it. It's pretty cool. It's got a great ending. I really enjoy the ending in this book. Uh, I'm going to not go any further than that. I don't want to go into any great detail or spoil anything. I'm going to now do the old horror meter, story meter, recommended. <coughs> Pardon me. <sighs> Uh, horror meter, I don't know, like a four. Story, five. Recommended, sure. I don't know, maybe try and go out and get The Elect and The Devil's Maze as well. He's got other stuff, I can't remember the names though, but Gerald Suster, The Offering. Pretty cool. Moving on. Alright, I'd like to move on to a rather heavy hitter from uh, this field of writing, aka the uh, B-grade underground world of paperbacks, and all that pulp fiction type kind of stuff. It's not fucking John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson, thank you very much. Here we got Guy N. Smith, The Sucking Pit. Guy N. Smith, every, everybody should own at least one or five Guy N. Smith's books. He's got that many of them out there. He's, the, he's just the master of straight cut to the chase, um, blood and guts and, you know, perversion and just, you know, nothing, nothing's watered down with Guy and Smith. It's exactly what you want if you've got, let's say you're a reader, you're an avid reader, you like to dig deep, but you can also maybe tend to not have a great deal of time on your hands or you've got a goldfish brain, which I can happen to have sometimes myself. Uh, this book is awesome. It's one of the earliest of Guy and Smith's, I think it's maybe 1975, 1976. He's best known for all his, his chain of killer crabs stories. You know, you've got cra uh, his Night of the Crabs, Killer Crabs, Crab Sacrifice, Crab Moon, uh, Crabs in My Pubic Hair, uh, and everything. Everything's a winner. Everything's a fucking winner. This book is almost comical. It's great. It's just, it, it, it's a very quick escalating book. I highly urge anybody, if you come across this one, to read it. It's a fucking relic. I'm very happy to have this old first, uh, it's a, I think it's a new English library edition of this book. It's, you know, as you look at the color of those pages, it's, the thing is becoming ancient, so I want to look after it. Uh, basically what the story is, the long and short of it is, it's based in a town called Hopwaz Wood, which I believe is actually a real place and possibly, don't quote me on this, is maybe where Guy Ann Smith was either born or spent time uh, in any of maybe his childhood years or his early adult years or something like that. But uh, so it's set in Hopwaz Wood, yeah, of course a small town full of, you know, delinquents and things like that. And there's this big community of dirty gypsies. Uh, and this, this young woman, she comes to meet her uncle, who's a part of the community of dirty gypsies, finds him dead in his dilapidated old house, uh, finds his diary and very quickly realizes that, uh, you know, all the, him and all his gypsy friends are all into hocus pocus mischief. And, so she starts reading and reading and reading all about this stuff, so intrigued by it, just sucked into the pages. Uh, and she finds a recipe for a vile potion that she happens to drink. And it, it's like it invigorates her. And it, it kind of takes her to a higher state of, um, let's say, you know, conscience. Uh, almost like an amphetamine or something like that. 
And so after this happens, the leader of the gypsy clan finds her and says, okay, so your uncle is dead and now you know too much. You've read the diary. You know all about this. You now have to be binded to me and binded to our, our gypsy community. And so they, so they get involved in all sorts of the crazy uh, obscure death rituals and things, which is where the sucking pit itself comes in. Uh, basically, I'm going to wrap it up in a second with this one, but what's so great about this book is it's almost, you know, there, there, there's, there, there's no room for um, becoming stagnant or long-winded. It's every chapter there's uh, either death or, you know, perversion or death-related perversion or perversion that turns into death. And it's, it's fucking great. Uh, so I'm just going to say it's on the horror meter. This one, uh, a four, story, a five, recommended, absolutely, absolutely, everybody should read Guy Ann Smith. I could do a whole video on Guy Ann Smith. Actually, in fact, just quickly, just quickly, I want to talk about this. The Neophyte by Guy Ann Smith is what I'm currently reading. I'm not going to talk about this for a great deal of time. It just happens to be, coincidentally, what I'm reading right now is Guy Ann Smith. I saw this book when I was a little, when I was a little pup, you know, when I was a little fucker, and um, I remembered the cat, I remembered the title, the near fight, but I couldn't remember who the author was. You know, I just remembered seeing this book and being super taken by it as a little kid. You know, you're very impressionable to, you know, horror and fantasy and stuff like that. But of course, I wasn't going to be reading a novel, let alone a horror novel, and then, you know, fucking wetting myself and shit, you know. I was only like fucking eight years old. Anyways, all these years later, I find this book, and it's by Guy Ann Smith. Fucking A. It's got a pretty lengthy prologue to it. I'm just going to quickly say before I move on. It's got a pretty lengthy prologue, but that was great is in the tradition of Guy and Smith's writing. Uh, it, yeah, it's very to the punch. A lot of really grimy stuff happens in this book, but obviously this one's a little bit more in depth. You know, there's a bit more going on in here, so I've still got a bit to read. But in the prologue, uh, a bloke, just to give you an example of what happens, a bloke, he cheats on his wife. His wife is a witch, so she curses him. He goes to work the next day, and he gets gored by a bull, specifically in the downstairs, gets his ball bags ripped open by a bull horn. Oh, can you imagine that for a day in the office? Anyways, moving on. So, oh, I'm going to bring out a, uh, what I would like to call a juggernaut of a book right now, mainly to talk about the author himself. If you can see that on my shitty camera, William Peter Blatty, Legion. The man responsible for, in my opinion, the greatest story of all time, The Exorcist. That's just my opinion. It's my favourite movie ever. And uh, so, which ultimately means that the book is one of my favourite stories ever, and I'm happy I do have the book up here. Unfortunately, I don't think I have an original pressing. Uh, I've got maybe an early 80s pressing, but uh, that's okay, because I've got to have it. Now, when I found out that there was a sequel to The Exorcist that was not related to The Heretic, which is the film sequel, which we're not talking about that monstrosity, that fucking mistake, should have been aborted. Uh, when I found out that there was an Exorcist sequel by Blatty, and it was not related to The Heretic, but it also intertwined with The Exorcist itself, I nearly jumped out of my skin and I just thought to myself, fuck, I've got to get that book, I've got to read it. And here it is, it's Legion. So, this book, very different, very, very different to The Exorcist. It is, it's, it's not like they're trying to just recycle shit for marketing purposes. William Peter Blatty is definitely going down a different avenue in this. Uh, it definitely really bringing out the intellect in this is um it's it, it's all it all follows forensics this is probably not really any news any news to anybody who's already well aware of this story but um it follows 
a Lieutenant Kinnerman, who is from the original Exorcist film, Exorcist film, pardon me, who, uh, he likes films and theatre, yeah, if that rejogs your memory from the original story. And you've also got Father Dyer in here, who was... Alright, so we just had a uh, technical fuck-up where my dated old electronic device ran out of space and gave us the chop. So, I'm just gonna kick it off again and try and pick up where we left off. Yeah, the joys of not having a fucking Samsung Galaxy or some shit. Anyways, we were talking about Legion. Uh, Legion, you've got Lieutenant Kinnaman and Father Dyer, both from the original Exorcist film. And Father Dyer, I think I was saying, is it was a good friend of Damien Karras, who was a part of performing the original Exorcism on Reagan and was threw him well he threw himself out the window and down the stairs and he died and this book pretty much just goes straight back on from this story in, back in Georgetown and uh, it's you know what I'm, I'm just gonna go quick quick straight to it there there were points in this book where you've got Lieutenant Kinderman as the main character and his kind of inner ramblings uh, it, which was almost maybe strenuous to read at points. Uh, some very, some very long-winded kind of sections to the story where it's as if he's pulling out, you know, his own kind of forms of poetry and things. But I think that in that case, that was uh, William Peter Blatty himself kind of throwing the poet within himself into the book. Which is really cool in ways. It's um, so the book is broken down into two parts. I'm just going to keep moving. The book was broken down into two parts, and part two, or well, the end of part one, and then into the beginning of part two of this story, is uh, that's where all shit starts to hit the fan. And um, I'm you know a lot of people already know very well about this book. But uh, I'm personally, right now, I'm not actually going to speak about the story itself. Uh, we're just going to... I just wanted to pull it up because I love The Exorcist so much and I did really enjoy this book and I do really uh, have a lot of uh, respect and I hold William Peter Blatty on a pedestal. Uh, excellent read. Excellent, excellent read. I'm going to go straight to it. The Horror meter on this is a for the book uh, there is a film of this it was called the exorcist 3 it came out in i think the early 90s uh which i think bladdy had a lot to do with just like the original film i think i don't i don't know if he he directed it or just had a lot to do with the screenplay um but in comparison to the film i'll just and and then the book the horror rating on this on the psychological end, it's, man, it's it's a good maybe seven or eight. <clears throat> Once again, there we go. I cracked myself a new drink because starting a new, starting a new section, reeling again. Um, a good, good seven on the, uh, on the horror, on the horror level here. The story, I'd give it an eight. Definitely an eight. There's some there's some sad bits in the story. I will let you know there is some sad stuff in here for anybody that doesn't know or is as interested in trying to read a sequel to the fucking greatest story ever told. Um, recommended. It's a no-brainer, of course. It's recommended. If you get your hands on Legion, please get your hands on Legion. All right, moving on. This is going to be my final book for this video until next time if you can see that john saul hellfire john saul he did uh brainchild suffer the children all that he he's another one of those guys who he's good at putting kids in the equation you know he's good at putting kids in the story and using them for leverage as far as horror goes and in this case kids are slaves in a mill and this whole story is based around a mill in a town of uh, Westover in Massachusetts. Um, 
basically the gist of the story is uh, a mother and a daughter, the mother's name is uh, Carolyn Rogers and her daughter is Beth. Uh, they move in because they move into a, uh, a large mansion on the hill in Westover basically because Carolyn is married into a very, very wealthy family. And like any kind of dark fairy tale or something like that, the family who are very wealthy are also very cold and rotten at heart. Uh, their family is the Sturgis family. Carolyn marries Philip Sturgis, and he's he's an alright guy. He's pretty cool. He's he's a good guy. Um, he's got a lot of redeeming a lot of redeeming characteristics about him. But um, his family, as in his daughter and his mother and his then passed away father were not cut from the same cloth you know like they they were really just completely wrapped up in you know rich successful comfortable lifestyle uh, and trying i guess attempting to be impervious to the fact that uh, all of their wealth came from child slavery in a shoe tailoring mill yeah, so basically this book, we, as I was reading it, it's almost as if you're reading some kind of borderline Victorian era drama novel, but uh, don't let that put you off because it's all so necessary for uh, the development of the story itself and all the character development and everything. Um, you've, got the, you've got the daughter, Stacey Sturgis, and the uh, old lady, the old lady, you got to have the evil old lady who is uh, Abigail Sturgis. They're the kind of characters in this that they are so horrible that you just you just want to see them fucking die. Yeah, you got to have that in the book. You got to have characters who they they linger in there, they hang on, and they they just build. Uh, you, you end up just having there's animosity for them, but you know before you even know about them, and um, the. Oh, the just the 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 inner turmoil and the I guess the social toxicity within the family of the in-laws and all within the house in this book is just amazing. So it's a very personal book. This one, uh, it's very emotional. It's a very tragic story. Um, you do, I would recommend reading this book from beginning to end. Because, uh, yeah, there's, there's some very devastating events in this book. And through all of the, all of the drama and all of the, the social side of things, uh, it does spawn a lot of evil and a lot of darkness. And the climax, the brilliant climax, excellent climax. Uh, it's an ending. I love the ending in this book. Uh, John Saul is definitely... Uh, definitely another one who I have said it once and I'll say it again and I'll say it again and again. Another writer who's definitely worthy of praise and definitely worthy of being recognised in the uh, more underground field of writers. Uh, Hellfire, I'm going to say straight up, Horror Factor. Hmm, Horror Factor. I'll give it a seven. The story... I'll give it an 8. I really enjoyed this one. There we go again. And recommended, absolutely. If you find Hellfire, pick it up. If you find Suffer the Children, pick it up. So on, so forth. John Saul, awesome. Alright, that's pretty much it. That's all of my ramblings for this evening. I'll see you again next time if you care. I'm not going to say click subscribe on my shit. You do what you want. You know? Just cheers for uh, dropping by. And as always, I'd love to hear from anybody if they want to have, have, an, have an exciting you know, conversation about you know, horror and fiction in general and any kind, of, any kind of literature gold like this, which is what we would view as literature gold, I guess. Um, I'll get back to you when I do if you do want to message me I usually drop off the radar from civilization on a weekly basis and go out and I don't know like 
hunt animals and eat them and shit, you know. <laughs> no, whatever. Uh, but anyways, cheers for stopping by. Uh, let us know what you think about any of these books if you want or flick us a message with some recommendations of anything to read. I might have it here or I might be wanting to get it or I might, you know, I may or may not be aware of something. But uh, it would be good to connect with anybody and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.